at one point or another. Well, why don't we get started since we're all here and um, let me welcome everyone. This evening, I'm Paula Kaufman. I'll be our moderator. Um, and we have people in the room and we have people on Zoom. So uh, Tricia is going to monitor our online uh, questions and um, you can put questions in the chat or raise the little chat, you know, a hand thing that comes under reactions. Um, and there are few enough of us so that we should be able to, to work this well. We're going to start, uh, Pam and I will have a little dialogue, okay. a little conversation okay. based on some questions that we provided her earlier. Uh -huh. And then we'll just open it up for everyone. Um, and if someone has a burning question, I think oh, we, sure. can, we can stop and <laughs> we can you know, do all that. burning questions. But exactly. But let me start with an introduction. So uh, Pamela Lau is, as you all know, the president of Parkland College, um, officially as of January 1st. Yes. Um, she came to Parkland College first as a part-time faculty member in developmental reading in 1995. And over the years, she has had uh, different leadership roles. Um, that enhanced the college's effort to provide quality ac academic programs and improve student learning and success. She, in the past, has been the uh, Critical Comprehension Skills Program Director, the founding director of the Center for Academic Success, the Dean of Academic Services, and Vice President for Academic Services. Um, Pam did her bachelor's degree in philosophy, first class honors, of course, mm -hmm. at the University of Singapore. She has a master's degree in philosophy from the University of Chicago. And then through the Kellogg Institute at Appalachian University, she was credentialed as a developmental education specialist. She graduated from Ferris State University in 2015 with a doctorate in community college leadership and received the Scholar Practitioner Award. And then in 2017, received the National Council for Instructional Administrators Emerging Chief Academic Officer Award. She was selected as a fellow for the Aspen Rising Presidents Fellowship, Cohort 6. Pam and her husband Lawson live in Muhammad. They have two grown children, um, Andriana and John Mark, um, and their undergraduate and graduate experiences had, saw them seeing time at both Parkland and the University of Illinois. So they are homegrown. Yes, uh, homegrown clear, kids. Clearly, although uh -huh. both working out of the, yes. this immediate area, mm -hmm. one in state and one close by. Yeah. So um, for those of you online, um, Pam has handed out a two-page back-to-back on um, Parkland at a glance that is on the website. Yes, it under, is. Under data and reports. So it's, it's several clicks and you have to look under, under administration and then there is the IAR, that's institutional accountability and research. And then on that page, there are several different things and you can read all the things about Parkland in terms of all of our data and reports. But the first item under data and reports will, this, will be the Parkland at a glance. We update that every year. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's great. So these are up to date yeah, right up to now. Date, right. Mm -hmm. So there, there are many statistics here, but the one that you probably want to know first off is how many students there are. So there are 344,000. The, that's the total number of students mm -hmm. served Which since means... we started oh. in 1967. Oh, so okay. not yeah, yeah. Yeah. That was <laughs> a lot of wonderful. students. <laughs> 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 you take over the whole area yeah, here, right, wouldn't yeah. you? Mm -hmm. Yes, I should have rec recognized. I'm not going to look yeah. at these statistics. Um, <laughs> I know there are too many numbers. <laughs> right, right. So we were chatting before mm -hmm. the rest of you joined us. Mm -hmm. And um, perhaps you could talk about what a community college is and how it, it's differentiated from mm -hmm. uh, the like the University of Illinois. So Parkland is what we call a comprehensive community college. And uh, without going into the long history of community colleges, uh, we, we have primarily uh, several uh, primary functions. One is to prepare students for transfer. And I think that was originally the first, uh, the, the, the first function that was dreamed of when mm -hmm. community colleges uh, came into being, that we were to provide the first two years of an undergraduate degree 
and that we will then uh, transfer those students over to a four-year university. And that remains one of our primary functions here in that when students come to Parkland and we look at the attempted hours in mm -hmm. terms of how many credits that uh, students sign up for, I can see that about 70%, usually 70%, it can be 67, it can be 71, depending on the semester, uh, about 70% of the credits are what we call transfer credits, right? So you can see that a lot of students come to us for that. The second big function of a community college is to prepare the students for work. Mm -hmm. So we have uh, different applied science degrees. So this would be technology degrees, uh, preparing technicians in all areas. Uh, in, in one sense, you can say a nurse is a technician. It is an application of a lot of the technologies of how to care for people. And so we have technician programs in, in a lot of different areas. And so a lot of our students come to us, prepare uh, to enter into the workforce. Mm -hmm. And that will be the strong prong of uh, the work of community college. If you are kind of listening to a lot of the, the national talk and the focus on workforce development. That's a phrase that you hear over and over again. And how in recent years, uh, there has been a, a lot of focus that it is the community college that can provide the workforce for the 21st century workforce that the, mm -hmm. that the nation needs. It is because we have applied science degrees that we work with employers. What is it that you need? We provide the training and the students go in, in, into to work. While we say that there are transfer degrees so that students can go on to a four-year degree and we have applied science degrees, which are two-year degrees, and you can go straight into the workforce, it doesn't mean that if you choose the career path that you don't have a chance to finish a bachelor's degree. Mm -hmm. What we do find is that a lot of students come, they get the two-year, and some of our students will say, I want to get skills. I want to be able to get a job. Mm -hmm. I do not want to read big fat textbooks. I do not want to write long papers. And I don't want to do complicated math, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but they they have a, what we call different intelligences mm -hmm. and they want to work with their hands. They are very good at that practical, critical thinking. We prepare students for that. So two years is good enough for entry-level technician work. However, we find that some of our students, as they are working, they are doing very well. There's promotion within, and when there's time or, or there's opportunity to, let's say, rise in the ranks, a bachelor's degree is probably very helpful mm -hmm. to get the promotion or to, even if the, the bachelor's degree is not required, some of the learning in terms of management skills, conflict management skills, uh, business level work, that there are opportunities for our students to, to go on to uh, finish uh, a baccalaureate degree in, in different areas mm -hmm. and sometimes an applied baccalaureate degree. Uh, I think one of the questions that were there, like what, right. how do we partner with uh, universities? Mm -hmm. uh, so for example, if a student takes automotive technology with us and they get a two-year degree in automotive technology and they can get a job with a lot of car dealerships mm -hmm. because they're desperate for skilled technicians, mm -hmm with whether it's um, whether they have certifications with a Ford company or other companies, right? They, they are really needed. But if the student wanted to go on and finish a bachelor's degree, uh, we would often say you can go to Ferris State University uh, in Michigan, or you can go south to uh, SIU at Carbondale, that applied baccalaureate degrees uh, mm -hmm. in automotive technology, mm -hmm. and you can get jobs too, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, so it's not that if you choose career, you can't finish it. And, and that's sometimes, uh, can I say, people don't understand that. So it's not like, well, if you want a bachelor's degree, you better go this way. No, you can go through the applied science degree, mm -hmm. and you can mm -hmm. get a bachelor's degree too. So those two are the big things we do. Uh, we also provide uh, developmental education uh, for different reasons. When some students come to us, they're not ready mm -hmm. uh, for college level math, sometimes not ready for college level writing, uh, they, their reading skills. And reading skills, we're not talking really about whether you can pronounce words on a piece of paper. Reading skills very much is what I call reading to learn. You'll be able to extract the main ideas out of a text uh, in order to be able to say, 
okay, after these many sentences, I can tell you that these are the three main things, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So helping students to be able to see what's the more important thing. So in developmental ed, we do a lot of that. Uh, then we also have adult education. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, we have students that come to us who have not finished uh, their high school uh, diploma. And so they come to us to finish the high school diploma. And in the past, adult education has been associated primarily with the completion of high school. So sort of yeah. early school leavers, like didn't finish, mm -hmm. come here. Uh, you've probably heard the acronym GED, mm -hmm. right? So yeah. they come to us to get the GED. But in recent years, the emphasis, at least from the funders of adult education, money comes from the federal government through the state uh, and, and comes to us, that the funders for adult education have actually, can I say, put less emphasis on the completion of the GED, uh, that the completion is sort of, by the way, you should do that that adult education, uh, the, the performance that they are rated on is how many of the students that go through adult education can get an industry recognized credential so that they can start earning. Because the GED in and of itself might not always translate to the ability to get life-sustaining wages. Mm -hmm. So now adult ed has, you know, while they are helping their students finishing up to do whatever to get that high school equivalency, at the same time, we're talking about what particular career pathway. And so the non-credit that takes, uh, uh, studying that takes place in adult education is matched very closely with our career programs. And I talked about our applied science degrees, mm -hmm. two years, mm -hmm. but we also do what we call stackable credentials. So that let's say you are going to work for a two-year degree in um, industrial maintenance. You can decide that you're going to start off toward that particular degree to get a welding certificate. Okay. 16 credit hours gets your welding certificate you get that you can go out and work you can come back in mm -hmm. and get another one and then you can get yet another one so that the, the um, rethinking the the learning like a highway with on on ramps and off ramps mm -hmm. you come on in get whatever skill training you need at a certain point, you can say, I'm taking that off ramp because I'm going off to work. I can come back and get the next mm -hmm. and get the next. So some people break it up mm -hmm. over the years in order to get that two-year degree. But the opportunity to keep in employment mm -hmm. and for a lot of our students, the more we reach out to get people from the outside to come in, we realize that our students are not traditional students right so the ability to do the I study I learn I get skills and go back out right and and doing that kind of flexibility is a very important part of mm -hmm. what we do mm -hmm. and then the fifth uh, area so we've got uh, transfer we have applied science programs we have adult education developmental education and the fifth one is our non-credit community education mm -hmm. and community education uh there's a there's a a, a, a range of of, of different mm -hmm. uh uh classes that they offer we can do the basket weaving right. the making of beads <laughs> and the cooking and all the fun stuff right? right and so people come in and a lot of people know us for that come in go learn this and then you, you go out right uh we also have customized training uh with companies mm -hmm that uh, want to provide an opportunity for their employees to upskill in a certain way. So we can do leadership, we can do management, or they say, get some Microsoft application mm -hmm. skills, right? Mm -hmm. Come into community ed, and then you can go back out and work. So they're non-credit. It doesn't go on an academic transcript. Mm -hmm. It doesn't go with you anywhere uh, in terms of if you want to get an academic degree, but we provide that kind mm -hmm. of uh, continuing education for the community. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people know us through community. Mm -hmm. And yeah. that's just community yeah. ed used to also pre-pandemic organize uh, overseas trips. Mm -hmm. In yes. fact, I think 
the summer before the pandemic, I went on one to Croatia. Oh, that must be a nice. Yeah. Mm. Well, they're doing day trips again. Yes, right. Starting inching back in. Yes, right? yes. I've mm. signed up for. <laughs> I I have a suggestion. Can you just move a little closer together, and you'll uh -huh. uh, <laughs> the oh, faces. Yes. But in the you'll be both uh, really present in the recording, which uh, you oh, know. Okay. okay. All right. Sure. Mm -hmm. there we yeah. go. But I also have a question, which is, what are you, the most popular applied sciences degrees you have? I mean, where, what kinds of, of bus, uh, you know, technology or business are these, are many of your students going to? Our most popular in that they are the most well-known would be the applied science degrees in our health professions mm -hmm. area. Yeah. So uh, in health professions, we are probably the most well-known for nursing two-year uh, associate degree in nursing, mm -hmm. uh, at the end of which you can take your NCLEX, you can get your license, so you get your boards done, you get your license to practice as a nurse, so two-year degree in that. But nursing is not the only thing in health professions. We have a lot of what we call allied health uh, programs, so uh, that would include surgical technologists, respiratory therapists, uh, technicians, uh, the pandemic has made that a, a well-known skill that is much needed. And if you know anybody who's interested, we have a lot of, we have seats. Not a lot of people actually apply for respiratory care. Mm -hmm. uh, I was hoping that the pandemic would make people realize mm -hmm. uh, how important it is. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think the pandemic might have scared people away. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which was very interesting. I didn't expect that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, so, so that, that's uh, Carl, Carl um, Clinic uh, always tells us that they're desperate for getting more skilled technicians in respiratory care. So that's that. Mm -hmm. uh, we have massage therapy. We have uh, dental hygiene. Mm -hmm. uh, our dental hygienist. Right. Uh, so most of our health professions, uh, students will go out to, to the hospitals mm -hmm. around here to do their clinicals. Mm -hmm. The dental hygienists do their clinicals on site. We have a dental clinic mm -hmm. and uh, the community can come. You can come and get your teeth cleaned for very little money. <laughs> it takes a little bit longer. <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, they got to practice a bit. Right. Right. <laughs> but we do have dentists on site. We actually have dentists come oh. because whenever the clinic is open, there must be a dentist. Yeah. Okay. Plus a faculty member to do it. Right? Yeah. So, so that the, the dentist will just like when we go to the dentist, right? Mm -hmm. uh, that the, the hygienist will clean our teeth and then the dentist will come and take a look at the teeth and see if there's anything that needs to be done uh, to keep your dental health. And do you uh, have enough patients to keep your students occupied? I think so. Uh, but uh, if you know of people who need it, <laughs> they're always more than welcome. And then the students also uh, do service to the community. So recently they had, uh, what do you call it? Keep a, keep a smile healthy day. <laughs> it was for children. Oh, nice. Uh, it was on Saturday morning, eight to noon, free. We have dentists come. I heard that that morning they had 155 people come through. Oh, nice. Um, nice. And the yeah. uh, $34,000 worth of dental care was given. <laughs> wow, wow, marvelous. That's yeah. great. And so our students get a chance to see that the skills that they are learning actually can be used to help uh, the people in the community. Mm -hmm. We do it also, we also have a day for the Hispanic community where then the students also, we, that uh, is a special reach, uh, outreach to the Hispanic mm -hmm. community. We do that too. Right, so different ways of, of okay. helping students. So uh, health professions is one of the most popular because again, the, sh the, the assurance of a job mm -hmm. is big. The other thing that is really growing in, in our applied science programs would be uh, in agriculture. Mm -hmm. uh, so our, ag uh, our agricultural technologies department encompasses several different areas in ag. Uh, one of the big and growing areas is in diesel technology, 
you can see the big tractors that are out there, yeah. right? We, 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 we grow around, right? That's right. Like everywhere you go. Uh, our students learn to fix those tractors and maintain them. So it's a two-year degree where you come in, you learn to take apart the engine and you put it back together. Mm -hmm. uh, they, uh, we, we have what we call a generic diesel program. We have 20 students, we take in 20 students a year. We have 20 seats filled. Right. Uh, we also have a program called the Case New Holland program. Mm -hmm. And uh, we work together with the Berkey store and uh, their dealerships. They, they have their, their big network of, uh, of dealers mm -hmm. uh, for Case New Holland. So we have a lot of uh, blue and red machines on campus. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Case New Holland works with us uh, through Berkey's. Uh, they provide. The, the tractors for us so yeah. the students are working on the latest mm -hmm. up-to-date machines cool. and they all have assured jobs because in order to sign up for that you come in with a sponsoring dealer oh, oh okay and the cool. students get thousands several thousand dollars worth of free tools and for them that is that's their work kit yeah that they leave us with those tools and they go to work wow uh, so so that is a growing program in fact mm -hmm. i heard that there was a waiting list this mm -hmm. year for case new holland and we're hoping that uh in the near future we'll add one more <laughs> but that's sort of in the works so right. we can't talk too much about that right now okay. right. Well, can we talk money yes okay can, can you tell us first of all what does it cost to come here uh -huh. um and then talk about funding and the governor's budget plan which okay. calls for an increase yes so if you follow the news you will have uh, heard that um, just last week is it last week yes mm -hmm. just last week uh our board of trustees mm -hmm. uh they they spent several hours in what we call a budget workshop yeah. where our cfo yeah. chris randalls mm -hmm. uh, presents the state of uh, uh the budget and then uh, they have to decide whether to raise tuition or not. Mm -hmm. We did not raise tuition for four years in a row. We kept tuition flat. So how much does it cost to come to Parkland College uh, today, uh -huh. right? Not, <laughs> not, not the new one, right? right? So today, uh, if you live in the district, you will pay $171 per credit hour unless you are in a program where we charge you what we call a tier two tuition rate. Uh, the tier two tuition is $274. Uh, the students that are in the Case New Holland program, okay. uh, the students that are in a lot of our accredited health professions programs, X-ray, surge tech, all of that. They will pay the two hundred and seventy dollars a credit hour mm -hmm. because clinicals and all are very mm -hmm. uh, um, expensive to run. Also, our aviation students. We do have an aviation program. Uh, in in twenty fourteen, uh, the Institute of Aviation at Willard Airport transferred to us from the University yeah. of Illinois, yeah, and yeah. so the yeah. program is still. I was going to say it's still running, it's still flying, <laughs> <laughs> and it's doing very well, and uh, it's in in great demand. Mm -hmm. uh, we started when we first started uh, in twenty fourteen. We had barely twenty something students, and most of them were not degree seeking. They were actually students at the university who just wanted to fly. Yeah. Right. <laughs> uh, we now most of our students are not just university students who want to take a class or two in flying these are students who want to become pilots so they come to parkland mm -hmm. to become pilots and uh this year we have about a hundred over students mm -hmm. in flight we have 40 over students who are taking drones uh we call them UAS classes, mm -hmm. unmanned aerial systems. That's the fancy, <laughs> that's the fancy term for drones, mm -hmm. right? So that's very, very popular too. Uh, so that's another one of our big programs. So okay. the cost is uh, that uh, we, we are going to increase the cost of that in-district credit hour uh, by $6.25. So mm -hmm. there's a four, four point something increase. Mm -hmm. 
And so if you think in terms of four years of no tuition increase, mm -hmm. it's sort of like 1% a year, a year, right? Sort of. Yeah, sort of. <laughs> uh, we also increase the student activity fee. For more than 10 years now, we left the student activity fee stagnant at $1.75. And the student government, uh, because their ability to fund student engagement activities comes from that part of my, yeah. you know, all the okay. clubs yeah. and how much yeah. they can get. And because we have suffered from falling enrollment, uh, then with $1.25 over 10 years, you know, the, and falling enrollment, they get less and mm -hmm. less of that. So they actually petitioned the board to increase that to $3. Mm -hmm. So from $1.75, they increased it by $1.25, mm -hmm. right? So altogether, uh, a student that's coming to Parkland next year, they will pay $7.50 more per credit hour. So if you think of a student that is, uh, if you think of a student as a traditional student who would take 30 credit hours in the course of two semesters, okay. that student, uh, tuition and fees bill would increase by $225. So, so that's sort of the, the picture and, of how much it costs to come to Parkland. Okay, and so what, what's the total cost if you're taking 30 credit hours? Oh, okay. <laughs> that's that's okay. We, we can we can all figure that out. Okay. We can we can all do that. Mm -hmm. So actually, the truth is, most of our students are part time. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, Sixty two percent of our students are part time students. Yeah. So we 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 don't have as many full time students. Now, uh, part of what the the board had to consider in should we raise tuition or not. If you look at our balance sheet, the college is actually in a strong financial position. However, there were several things that the board had to take into consideration. Since 2010, we have been suffering from falling enrollment. 10 years. Mm -hmm. Actually, this semester, we, compared to the year before, we've been in the positive. Hmm. This is the third semester in a row that we've been in a positive. So we are positive summer, positive fall, positive spring, compared to the year before. Hmm. It is the first time we've seen three semesters in a row with positive enrollment since 2010. Hmm. So we've fallen a lot. Mm -hmm. So we are doing our very best to keep that positive trend going. But again, after more than 10 years of falling enrollment, it's a little bit like one swallow does not a summer make. And so, <laughs> yeah. and so we have to be realistic. Uh, we are hoping that it will continue, but we don't know because there's so many other factors that we have to bear in mind. Mm -hmm. We are in a strong financial position currently uh, not because we had a huge increase in enrollment over the pandemic. We did not. It, we, we were hit okay. pretty hard, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but we had an infusion of federal money because of COVID. Oh, mm -hmm. right. And all education institutions across the country right. ha, uh, benefited from that because that was the way the government was going to shore up institutions. Mm -hmm. So we spent our money wisely and we had leftovers. So mm -hmm. uh, right. as all families do, right? You don't spend everything you, you, you get. You keep it for the rainy day because it's rained pretty hard. Right. right? So, <laughs> yeah. so, so we have leftover from that. We also had uh, an increase in something called CPPRT, Corporate Personal Replacement Tax. That's money okay. that comes to us. And every year we get about $2 million mm -hmm. over the last, I don't know, 20 years. Then all of a sudden in FY21, it was $5 million. Whoa. And then this current fiscal year was $7 million. Yeah. Wow. All the CFOs in the community colleges are actually 
Are you getting more? Mm-hmm. <laughs> yes. And everybody asks the question, why? why? Nobody knows. Oh, so we, you don't know if it'll continue. Right. Because <laughs> we asked the state and they don't know. The state is doing okay. right, so it comes to you. Or we'll take whatever you give us. Right. However, we do not know whether that will normalize. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So based on the fact that enrollment is good, but still not where it should be, and the fact that the infusion of cash from the federal government to keep us afloat is a one-time thing. So it's not a structural thing that you're going to receive. Mm -hmm. And we don't know whether the CPPR thing will will Mm -hmm. continue. The board decided it is wise to uh, raise tuition. If things look rosy or rosier the Mm -hmm. next year, because we make tuition decisions one year at a time, Next February, the board can decide, well, mm-hmm. we are in a stronger position. Maybe we do not need to raise the tuition. Mm-hmm. Uh, we, we also wanted to keep to, and this has been the, the practice over the, uh, the years, that we are to keep increases, small increases at a time. Because students tell us it is much easier for us to plan mm-hmm. a small increase. Because um, before Dr. Harris came, uh, that was 20 over years ago, Right, that uh, we would uh, the the board decided we won't raise taxes. I mean, uh, tuition. Then all of a sudden, it'll be a twenty buck increase. Right, so then it's a huge leap. That that's not yeah. good. So we've we've tried to keep it steady like that. Right. So the students agreed with us. Mm-hmm. Uh, we also have a practice of before we go to the board to make any recommendations uh, based on, on on how the finances look. Um, the vice president for student services and the chief academic uh, financial officer they always sit down with student government. Mm-hmm. This is what things look like. This is what we're projecting, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and yeah. so the students uh, were in agreement with us that this would be a wise increase. So. That so so we've we've increased, and then at the same time, Governor Pritzker mm-hmm. said that he was going to give us more money. Right. So it's a seven percent increase. Right. If the legislature agrees, yes, it's agrees. Right. It's a proposal. Right. right. So his proposal for community college is seven percent increase. For us, that comes up to about three hundred thousand okay. dollars. So so that is good. Yeah. Uh, and last year, I think we had an eight percent increase. So it it was okay. good. Because in 2015 and 2016, we had no state budget. Right, right. <laughs> so, so, so again, we right. don't know whether, we, <laughs> yeah, we have a lot of we don't knows. So that's good. The governor also has talked about increasing uh, the amount of aid for low income and some middle income families in order to make community college free. Mm-hmm. So what that means is a combination of what we call MAP money. MAP is Monetary Assistance Program, right? So that's state funded. So we have that. And then we have Pell, which comes from federal government. And a combination of those two, uh, if you are are eligible income-wise, that then community college would be free. MAP pays for tuition and fees and only pays for tuition and fees. So let's say you qualify for $2,000 worth of MAP. I'm just throwing a number out. But you're taking only enough classes uh, that will come up to $1,500. Okay. You don't get the extra $500. Oh, huh. yeah. It's only right. for tuition and fees. Sure. Right? But if you qualify for Pell, Pell allows for monies to be used for uh, study-related expenses. And you can take home books, right? yeah, books, books right? computers, and computers. Mm-hmm. So, and then whatever is left over, they know you have to live, yeah. right? So, so that can be used for that. So uh, we are hoping that uh, the Springfield will pass that mm-hmm. budget. Mm-hmm. And so it will, it will help our students mm-hmm. that have been hesitant right. to come back. Uh, we are hoping that with uh, the sort of we we are learning. We have learned to live with COVID, and that we won't have a new pandemic. Mm-hmm. Uh, that the students will that the 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 pace of return will will keep coming. Good. Does that answer? I, yes, it does. I have two more areas to ask you uh-huh. about, and then we'll we'll open it up. Uh-huh. Um, one is 
directly related to this last conversation, mm -hmm. and that's recruiting. Uh -huh. So how, how do you go out and get students? How we come? go out and right. get students, yeah. Uh, so part of what we do and what we've always done, uh, we have, uh, we, we have uh, recruiters that go out to the high schools. Mm -hmm. We speak to the high schools. And so uh, high school students come to Parkland from our area high schools at the rate of anywhere between 25 to 32 percent, depending on the high school, mm -hmm. right? So we are uh, 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 a definite choice mm -hmm. for a, a good segment of our high school. So, mm -hmm. so recruitment comes from there. Uh, we are also uh, focusing a lot on promoting our applied science degrees, because mm -hmm. I think that, you know, when you think of the mission of community colleges, uh, we were created so that everyone who wants to take advantage of post-secondary education has a chance to come. And I look, I, I take it as a very, as a, a very central part of the core of our work, that we are here not to just give learning for the sake of learning, which is always good. Mm -hmm. right? However, uh, more important is to be able to put the students on a pathway to a career where they have life-sustaining wages. Because for most people, the reason for choosing post-secondary, whether with us or somewhere else, that they want to use this as an opportunity to see that mobility in terms of economic mm -hmm. welfare and social standing, mm -hmm. right? That that is part of it. And so, uh, I believe very strongly that our applied science programs, coupled with good general education, is a very important part of what we do. And so when it comes to recruiting, we suffered from falling enrollment in part because the high school population is not growing. Right. Mm -hmm. It is actually shrinking. Right. Right. Yes, <laughs> right. So we are competing directly with the four-year schools. Mm -hmm. So we are, you know, colloquially, we say, we're fishing from the same side of the pond. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and when the bigger, the bigger, <laughs> fishes, <laughs> the bigger <laughs> fishes have ability to scoop deeper to maintain, because, to maintain their student population because that's tuition revenues, we suffer mm -hmm. because we don't have the brand name. We have very good experiences for our students, mm -hmm. but we can't yeah. offer the kind of brand name college experience right. that a lot of students are looking for. Right, right. And we don't have football. Right. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> our, our, our athletes do very well, but we don't have football. Right. And so we, we don't have that draw when we have a game here that people drive from all over to tailgate. Right. It right. doesn't happen. Right. So we know we are competing. So knowing that we, while we still want to continue to get the message out, that we are the best bang for your buck mm -hmm. because the quality of what we give is very good. We know that we cannot always compete with our four-year colleagues, right? They, right. They, they will do their thing and we have to do our thing. And when we are thinking in terms of the core of our mission, who do we want to serve? We really want to be able to help all and not just the smartest students mm -hmm. to be able to get into that college, uh, that career pathway mm -hmm. so that they can see for themselves mm -hmm. a way of making their way in life yeah. with something meaningful. And this, I think, is an important thing to know too, that when we help a student get the skills to get a well-paying job, a job that will pay better than my bachelor's in philosophy. <laughs> Just that. <laughs> that we not only affect the individual, we are changing the trajectory of families. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. Right. Because that family will know, their kids will no longer say we are first gen. Mm -hmm. And we don't know anything about college. Yeah. They will have parents that have gone through and they can say, you can do it too, mm -hmm. right? So if I'm thinking about that, then B 
being able to reach those that are staying on the outside of post-secondary, staying on the margins to bring them in to say, we have a place for you. Mm -hmm. So as I'm talking with our VPs and their directors, I'm saying we have to do our usual reach to the, not, to the traditional students, mm -hmm. but we got to find a way to bring others in right. because they will see that their hope in life is to come in and get that learning and mm -hmm. skill training with us mm -hmm. right so we are, we're doing two two things exactly. at the same time yeah and so we're going to reverse that enrollment trend by looking for the adults that are not coming in mm -hmm. and we just had a good conversation with Unit 4. We, we had oh, a very good, good meeting. Uh, we have brought a team over, Unit 4 brought that team, and we talked about where can we really connect. Mm -hmm. And they are also interested in helping us help students and their families to see that applied science programs are a good place mm -hmm. for their students. Mm -hmm. In a town like this, with the University of Illinois and all the brilliance that goes on there, and a lot of us here have got have benefited from the education that the university provides, there is also, I think, a misperception. The misperception in this, that if you are really smart, you go to the university. Yeah. And if you're not so smart, you can go to park and college. And if you're not so smart, then you can do the applied science. I want that message. And Unifor said, yes, we are with you then. Mm -hmm. It's not less than, it's different than. Right. There are different kinds of intelligences. Mm -hmm. And coming to us for applied science degree is actually not less than. <laughs> In fact, right. your earning power it's really right. good. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. like 60, 70 K. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, signing bonus because the, <laughs> the employees are desperate. Right. Uh, and, and so to that message. And so we talked a lot about how do we bring that message down to students and to their families? Mm -hmm. Because their families also have to know that this is so. Sure. The, stu the, the students on field trips can come and say, it was so exciting. I saw many good things at Parkland. Mm -hmm. and the, but they don't think about, but I can do this too yeah. without family support and family Ooh. enthusiasm. Right. So, right. Okay. <clears throat> so the other thing I want to ask about is the board of trustees. Mm -hmm. we, we have elections coming up mm -hmm. and we're going to all be voting uh -huh. on new trustees. What should we be looking for? You want to look for someone who understands the mission of community college, who would support our mission, who would be willing to learn about our mission because not everybody knows, right? What right. we do, right? We, we've just been here and everybody knows we're good. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and, we're, and where the campus is. But a lot of people don't actually know what we do right. because over and over again, when we have people come and we take them on tours, they'll say, I have lived here all my life. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know you did X, Y, or Z. Right? Mm -hmm. So we want them to be able to be willing to learn. And uh, it would be good too. Uh, I think the best trustees are the ones who understand our mission. And so they work with us to be able to promote the mission. And they don't come with a personal agenda <laughs> to do this or that, mm -hmm. which may or may not be part of what we do. Right. But how would we know as voters that... <laughs> They have a personal mission. <laughs> it is, I guess it's only by conversation right, to ask. Yeah. So, so yeah. why is it that you want to be a trustee? Right. We, we would college. go to the, the forums that we're, uh -huh. we're right. holding. Yes. Mm -hmm. And read information that they provide yeah. mm -hmm. to the candidate guide. Yeah. As well. Correct. Mm -hmm. Correct. Mm -hmm. we've, so, we've been very blessed with good trustees. Mm -hmm. And truly, that they they are interested in our work mm -hmm. as a community college, mm -hmm. right? Right. So we've not had to tangle with some of the uh, versions of other boards that I have heard of. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to pause and see whether we have questions. From we don't have any questions in the chat yet, so see if you have questions uh, in the room. Uh, Karen has one. 
Yeah, I, 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 I'm building on Paula's that she asked. I just, my question was a little more pointed. Um, so there's going to be, there's the, there's the uh, municipal election April 4, and Sundays there's the candidate forum, at the end of which there's a meet and greet for the people running for the positions on the Parkland Trust Board of Trustees. Mm -hmm. And my question is, what questions should voters be asking these candidates during the meet and greet? Like what, what issues and what particular questions would smart voters be asking these candidates? <laughs> I would say that one of the most important things, again, back to, do you understand what the community college is and why is it that you want to be a trustee? Uh, that, uh, and again, I understand that a lot of people on the outside don't know too much about us, but I think someone who's interested in running for, uh, to be one of our trustees should at least have looked at our website mm -hmm. to kind of understand what is it we do and, uh, what would be the important thing. And, and I know some people will say, I'm very interested in promoting this particular kind of program because I think it's very good. That's okay. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, but they know what we do mm -hmm. and what they, they have done. Mm -hmm. uh, some of the trustees uh, to all people who have been interested, they have come through a community college. It might not be Parkland, mm -hmm. right. but so they yeah. understand what we do. And, uh, and, and to ask them why, how, what will be some good ways of spreading the message about what we do at community colleges and uh, why, how we can best promote the the value of Parkland in the community. Thank you, that's great. Mm -hmm. Anne, did you have a question? I, I did. Um, I know that for a long time, Parkland had what we call dual credit yes. programs uh -huh. where high school students can take classes mm -hmm. here at Parkland while they're still in high school. And that provided a lot of opportunity for people to come to Parkland mm -hmm. to finish their education at least to the uh, two-year degree. Um, what's going on with dual credit now and in what fields uh, do high school students have the opportunity to come to Parkland? Okay. Let me ask first if you all heard that question. Yes, it was very clear. Okay, oh, great. Okay, great. Right. So dual credit is uh, basically uh, the, the name itself, right? That a student takes a class, is a college class, and the student earns high school credit at the same time mm -hmm. that they're getting college credit. And that's why it's dual. It fulfills high school requirements uh, and they get, uh, they start their college transcript. Right. We offer dual credit in two different ways. Uh, one, can I say a popular way is for dual credit to be offered in the high schools. Mm -hmm. And if uh, a high school has faculty that have the credentials that are required, then high schools can offer what we call general education mm -hmm. classes. Right? So English 101, Composition 1, is a very common one that is taught in a lot of high schools. Mm -hmm. So many students actually come out of high school having completed English 101. Uh, particularly so for students who have already decided that they are going to go to a four-year school. Mm -hmm. Many of them take our dual credit in the high schools and um, they may come to us, they may not come to us. Right. <laughs> right. And that's a different story. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so there is a law called the Dual Credit Quality Act. And under that law, uh, we we are required to allow high schools to offer our general education classes should they have the faculty who are minimally qualified. Mm -hmm. The qualifications for faculty to teach any of our transfer classes, uh, those qualifications are in a broad way set by our regional accreditor the Higher Learning Commission. So basically, if you're going to teach any, like a history class or a math class or a, a composition class, you must, have, you must have a master's in that discipline. Mm -hmm. If your master's is in a different discipline, 
then you must have at least 18 semester graduate credit hours in that discipline. So, so that's sort of, so we asked the high schools, mm -hmm. does your faculty have that? And, and then they work with our faculty as to what those classes are. We also have dual credit through the Early College and Career Academy. This mm -hmm. was started around 2014. Mm -hmm. uh, we offer, we call it the ECCA. The ECCA is offered in close collaboration with the EFE. EFE stands for Education for Employment, and they have very many different units, and ours is EFE 330. The director of EFE 330 is Nick Elder, and Nick Elder's office is here on campus. Together with Nick, we offer ECCA. Nick recruits students from the 13 area high schools that fall under his EFE. Mm -hmm. And so every morning, we have every Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday morning, between 7.30 to 9.30, we have about 150 to 165 high school students here on campus taking, they could be taking criminal justice, automotive technology, construction, computer science, education, and ag. Wonderful. Huh? Yeah. Yes. So those students are earning dual credit. And most of the duo, uh, the students that take part in ECCA, they will have started uh, towards getting at least a certificate and that they will then continue with us to complete a certificate and into the AAS. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, Great. if you take, if you're in health professions, you can take the CNA and because it's a one semester thing, mm -hmm. right. yeah. uh, you would yeah. actually be certified Right. By the time you leave high school. That's right. right. Yeah. yeah. We also allow for students to take EMS, one of that's uh, EMT, so mm -hmm. they can be an emergency mm -hmm. medical technician mm -hmm. in one semester. Yeah. Right. So they, they are credentialed. Um, <laughs> it's an excellent way to connect yes. the high schools yeah. with Parkland. Yes, that's very right. yes. Mm -hmm. absolutely. So we're very pleased with ECCA. We're right. looking for ways to see if we can increase. Yeah. Uh, because the, the school districts work with EFE to decide whether they can pay for the tuition that is associated with that, uh, or sometimes the students have to pay, so yes. the families yeah. have to pay. So maybe this is a last question, maybe not, um, but you've just started the Lao era here. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you had a long apprenticeship, but yes. now you're here. What do you want its hallmarks to be? What do I want its hallmarks to be? Which really means, what are your plans? You know, looking out five years or more, you know, right. yeah. what do you see? So actually, currently this year, uh, I have started working with uh, on on a new strategic plan, mm -hmm. right? So we've got our vision statement, and uh, we have five strategic goals. Uh, I was thinking of the vision statement that dream. That yeah, we're right. We're going to be a premier community college, and we're going to do all all the things that I said. Uh, the five strategic goals are sort of the, the things that we're going to focus on uh, as we look at the next five years uh, and uh, see if I can repeat them. <laughs> we want to empower the student. We want to enhance teaching and learning. We want to enrich the community. We want to invest in our employees. And we need to invest in our future. So that sort of is all encompassing. We start off with empowering the student because it's important that our students learn how to be successful. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that I think would be, I would like to be my legacy mm -hmm. is that we we are able to help more of our students stay successful. One of the challenges we face as a community college, because we have so many part-time students. So when you're part-time, you're also working. Mm -hmm. And so many of our students are parents. Mm -hmm. And when you're part-time, there is also more opportunity for what we say, life to happen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so then students 
will say, well, I can't manage school this semester. Mm -hmm. I'm going to, they're not going to drop out. They'll right. just step out mm -hmm. and they're always going to come back the next semester. Mm -hmm. So it's like a diet. Yeah, right. <laughs> diet tomorrow. So I'm coming back next semester. Yeah. And so then the success rate and the longer you stretch it, and we, we love you and you can come back anytime. Even in 20 years, your English 101 credit is still good credit, mm -hmm. right? However, the longer you stretch mm -hmm. it out, yeah. the less likely you are to come back and complete. Mm -hmm. And so we do have a challenge yeah. in keeping our students. And so if I can move the needle on completion, mm -hmm. that will be great. Mm -hmm. If I can move the needle on completion of the demographic groups that are not doing as well. So when I think of our Black students do not do as well as our white and our Asian students, we need to work on closing that gap. Mm -hmm. uh, we need to figure out how to, whether it's engagement in the class, outside of the class, supporting in terms of all the learning support. We have a newly developed learning commons where you can walk in with all your different needs whether it's computer, whether you don't know how to give your, your speech, whether it's writing, whether it's reading, whether it's math, we have all of that there. Uh, and so different corners of the library have been converted into what we call the learning commons. Mm -hmm. uh, we have different ways in which we can support students. So we are there to support. So the legacy mm -hmm. will be if I can start closing those gaps and right. I can begin helping adults who are on the outside to realize that they have a place here and that we can help them on their next step. That will be a win. Oh, and that's a wonderful way to close our hour with you. Thank you so much. Oh. This has been just wonderful. It didn't seem like an hour. And now I want to take a tour um, at some point. I would, I would love to take you all on the tour. And just tell me which area you want to see. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Great. Well, thank you. And thank You're you all welcome. on Zoom for being with us tonight. And uh, we'll see you all thank soon. Thank you. I'm very glad to meet all, all of you. <laughs>